I'm glad you're here. So there's something we haven't really talked about before, and that is artificial intelligence or AI. Now, I might be a little late to the party here, but you have to understand for a long time, there basically been two sides to robotics. The robotics that happens in research and there's robotics that happens in a factory. And in the past, it's taken a really long time for research technology to be viable in a production setting. However, the opportunity and interest for using AI and robotics is massive. And that momentum is putting those two worlds on a collision course. Let's talk about what happens when they collide. I'm Kel Guerin, and this is another Ready Session. Now, this isn't to say that this collision isn't already happening. There are already robotic systems right now being used in a production setting that are powered by some type of AI algorithm. However, it's not as remotely widespread as, say, AI used for image search or speech recognition or even self-driving cars. I'll also say that this video is not meant as a general overview of AI for robotics. There are tons of really great videos online covering that topic. Some of my favorites are by Peter Beal and Dieter Fox. Check the description below and go watch those videos if you're interested because they also get into the practical applications of AI for robots. So we've talked in a couple of other Ready sessions about why robots are needed more than ever in manufacturing. And it really comes down to the demand being placed on factories today and the fact that we can't find enough skilled people to do all of that work. We can solve this with robots, but an industrial robot by itself isn't very flexible. And that makes automation a challenge because the robot can't deal with the variability of a factory in the same way a person can. Now, the way that we get a robot to handle variability right now is through explicit programming. We essentially create a robot program for every part the robot is going to handle. So if you have a cylinder like this, you write a program just for this part. If your part looks like this, you write a separate program. So for manufacturers who run lots of different parts, this programming time becomes a bottleneck. If I have 10 parts, that's 10 programs. But what if I have 10 new parts a week? What about 10 new parts a day? That's a lot of programming time that a manufacturer has to deal with. Where humans excel is their ability to handle this variation. If a person has seen a lot of parts like this, and I give them a part like this, they can handle it no sweat. They take what they know about parts like this and adapt it for this new part. So can we imbue a robot like this guy with that similar intelligence powered by AI? Well, yes, but here's the root of every other challenge I'm gonna talk about. A person has had their entire life to interact with different objects. They've had time to experience lots of different circumstances. They have the data from all those experiences and they have the ability to adapt their previous experience to a new situation. If we think about the robot, that data is something that the robot needs to use AI to learn how to do those tasks. It takes time for those robots to learn it and they need to be able to adapt that knowledge to new experiences. The problem is we don't have a lifetime to wait for that robot to do that. So as I was just mentioning, one of the factors that makes people so good at doing physical tasks is that they have all the time to learn all of the variation and nuance that happens in the real world. For a robot like this, in a production setting, we don't have that kind of time. You see, this robot here is an asset. It's a device that's placed in a factory to create value. And the more that it can be running, putting parts into the machine behind me and doing its job, the more value it creates. Now this might seem obvious, but when we're talking about something as nuanced as AI, it's important to remember this robot is here to work. Another problem is variation. Remember, we programmed this robot to do one thing, to put a piece of metal into the machine behind it. It's gonna do that same action over and over again by design, and we want it to be as precisely the same every time it does it as possible, which means this robot isn't gonna see as much variation as you or I would see in our everyday lives. One potential shortcut is we don't do the learning on the physical robot at all. We do it in simulation. 
Simulation platforms such as Isaac Sim from NVIDIA or Gazebo from the Open Source Robotics Foundation are now realistic enough that they can almost replicate what it's like for a robot to interact with the physical world, complete with real physics and realistic lighting and textures. This means you can now spin up hundreds or thousands of simulated robots that are all able to perform this learning simultaneously. You can also easily create variation in these simulations, different parts, different tasks, you name it. That allows the robot to learn all of this variation that you want it to learn. You still have the challenge, however, of getting what you've learned back onto the real robot. And that's something I'll talk about in a minute. It's a fact. AI algorithms that perform well need lots of data. Lots. I'll put a link in the description to an awesome article on IEEE Spectrum that digs into this, but basically if you want an algorithm to perform better, you need more data. Let's say you have a vision algorithm that took 100,000 images to train, and it gets things right 90% of the time. If you want to get up to 95%, just 5% more, you might need up to 25 times that original data. In the areas that AI have been successful, there's lots of data. Speech recognition, image recognition, self-driving cars. There are millions or billions of sentences, images, and miles of driving data to learn those models on. In the robotic space, not so much. We just haven't been collecting a lot of data from robots, especially the type of data that we need for machine learning, such as the motions the robot makes or how it interacts with environment and how successful that interaction is. We need that data I spoke about before, doing things, making mistakes, and learning from those mistakes. Now, one area that we're starting to see more of this data collection is in the logistics space where there are now several robotic products that continuously refine their ability to pick parts by learning from when they miss a pick. But this kind of data collection is harder for the average factory robot, where instead of improving one key skill, like grabbing a part from a bin, the robot needs to be more general purpose. So let's say we start collecting this data, and let's say that we collect data from more than one robot doing lots of different tasks over time to give as much variation as we can. As I said before, we can do this in simulation too, but that introduces new challenges. If I have data coming from all of these different robots, many different brands, many different physical shapes and sizes, and now robots in simulation too, how do I make sure that all of that data is uniform so that I don't have to spend a ton of effort homogenizing it before I even get to start training an AI algorithm that we're talking about. This is a massive problem if we collect data from a bunch of different robots, each with their own data format and task language. This is where Forge OS comes in. Forge provides a common interface to any robot it works with. Now that means for people programming robots, they only have to learn one no-code programming system, but it also works for the data that we need for training AI. You see, Forge provides the same software interface to these robots too, which means if I'm collecting data from them, it looks the same, no matter what robot it's coming from. Let's come back to our easy no-code programming software, Task Canvas. We already mentioned that every robot that runs Forge speaks a common language, but because of Task Canvas, each of those robots speak a common task language as well. This means that the components that go into the robot task the building blocks, the structure, are going to be the same no matter what robot I program it on. So if I build a program using the Stabli robot and I build a program on that Kawasaki down at the end, that means that when I collect task data from those two robots to train my AI algorithm, that data is going to be consistent from both of those two tasks. So how do we take the algorithm we've now learned with all of that time and data and actually get it onto our specific robot? What if that robot is a different shape or has different tools or is a different brand than the real or simulated robots that we trained the algorithm on? Well, there are two challenges here. And the first is taking what we've learned and abstracting it to a new robot that might be a different shape or have different capabilities than the one we started with.
If we trained our algorithm on this FANUC with its two finger gripper, and we now want to use the HC10 back there with its suction cup for the task, we somehow need to abstract what we learned on the FANUC and adapt that to the HC10. Fortunately, there's a whole field of study in AI called transfer learning that's aiming to help us with this. Transfer learning allows us to represent the actions that the robot makes in a way that the hardware doesn't really matter. Instead, we think about the robot's actions in the abstract. After all, both of these robots are capable of moving. Both of them have a gripper of sorts, so we can take the motion and grasping actions from one robot and adapt those to the other, as long as we know the physical differences. Think of it like driving a car versus a truck. They're different, but fundamentally they're similar enough that I can drive them both to the grocery store just fine. I just need to know the differences so I can adapt from one to the other. The other issue is much more down to earth. What if our robots don't speak the same language? As we mentioned in other videos, most industrial robots have completely different programming languages and software interfaces, which means somehow we need to take what we've learned and adapt it to this specific brand of robot or that one. This is where Forge OS helps us again, because every Forge powered robot speaks the same language and has the same software interfaces. The same common operating system that helped us collect data in the same manner from all of those different robots helps us deploy what we've learned, that algorithm, onto any robot too. While methods like transfer learning extend the algorithm that we've learned to any different shape or size of robot with different tools or capabilities, Forge gives us the common language that we actually command to the robot once we've trained and are running our amazing AI algorithm.